All right. Hopefully you can hear me now. Great. So I'm going to start again. I want to welcome everyone to the Theology Mom podcast. And I want to say happy Wednesday to you wherever you are. Uh, it's a very hot day here in Southern California. And we're going to be talking tonight in this teaching about the question that I'm seeing many of my friends wrestle with right now. Does the story of Zacchaeus provide a biblical warrant for reparations? And um, I hope that this will be a helpful teaching as we step through the story of Zacchaeus tonight in some detail, um, as well as questions about reparations. So I want to invite you to get engaged with me on the chat box, and I'll be checking in from time to time on the chat box. Um, I've got uh, some of my team members. Well, really, it's Monique. <laughs> They're on the chat box helping me out to address the questions. And uh, yeah, we got the sound fixed. We're good to go. Um, looking forward to the conversation tonight. While we're here, make sure you uh, hit that thumbs up button there, wherever you are. Hit the like, hit the thumbs up. Make sure that you're subscribed on YouTube. YouTube has a little tendency at times to make that decision for you. Uh, so even if you've subscribed before, just take a minute to make sure that you're subscribed and hit that notifications bell so that you'll be alerted anytime that I go uh, live. And uh, I want to invite you to in join me on the chat. Uh, you can, the best place to do that is on YouTube. Uh, Facebook is a little more clunky, but if you want to do it on Facebook, Monique is there and she will try to help uh, guide the conversation. But I will be checking on YouTube throughout the conversation. So tonight I'm going to address the question, does the story of Zacchaeus provide biblical warrant for reparations? And see, Allison just said she had to resubscribe. Exactly. Uh, oh, Tony's joining us tonight from Melbourne. Hey, Tony. Welcome. I want, I'm want. i glad to see Nikki and my friend Susanna and Melissa and Laura's tuning in and Eula. Great to have all of you guys here. So look forward to the next hour as we unpack these questions related to Zacchaeus and reparations. Now, there is a growing chorus of people in the culture calling for reparations um, and this would include some of the former Democratic presidential candidates. Uh, many of them have put forth ideas based on some kind of reparations tax. Uh, there is a famous article by a black thinker that I would recommend. Uh, he's a gentleman named Ta Ta-Nehisi Coates, and he had an article in The Atlantic a few years ago. Here's a screen cap of that. And it is a very important and thoughtful argument. It's called the case for reparations. It's definitely worth taking the time to read and consider. It's a very long piece, but um, it is a great kind of lay level introduction into the case for reparations that many people are putting forward right now. Now, the main idea behind reparations is that unpaid slave labor helped to build the American economy. And this over time has created a vast wealth that uh, African-Americans were barred from sharing in for a very long time. And there is a historical warrant behind reparations uh, that not everybody is aware of. So I'm going to just kind of briefly summarize that here. General Sherman, who is uh, notoriously famous for burning from Atlanta to the sea um, as he was taking the South, uh, the Deep South, late in the Civil War in 1865, he made this statement about 40 acres and a mule for every former slave at the end of the Civil War. And this was thought at the time uh, to kind of represent what it would take for a former slave to be able to build a new life and support themselves. And you can go read more about this in the georgiaencyclopedia.org website. I think I have that here. Yep, there it is. And it's called Sherman's Field Order Number 15. And this gives a little summary of what went into this 40 acres and a mule thought. And the thought 
was that land that was confiscated from, from plantation owners at the end of the war would be redistributed to former slaves. And President Abraham Lincoln and the Congress actually approved this plan. And there were 40,000 freedmen in the South who actually started to plant and build on this land. However, within months of Lincoln's assassination, uh, President Johnson took over the presidency and Johnson actually rescinded the order and he returned the land to its former owners. And Congress did make another attempt at uh, compensation to former slaves, but Johnson vetoed it. So there was this thought at the end of the Civil War of providing, uh, uh, making a provision for former slaves through land and a mule. And a mule would sort of be um, a, a critical piece of equipment, if you will, for working that land and providing a pathway to self-sustenance. Now, one way of conceiving of re reparations, and there are many different reparations plans, and so I don't want to paint it as if there's only one plan because there just isn't, but this is one that is very popular, and it is to conceive of reparations by assigning an estimated value to the cost of an acre of land in 1865, which was about $10 an acre, so 40 acres uh, divided among a family of four comes to about uh, 10 acres a person. And it would be about $10 for, for each of the four or $100 for each of the 4 million uh, former slaves. And so then you kind of extrapolate from that number and, and compounding interest and inflation, you might assign a present day value to that um, 40 acres and a mule idea of some people have, have put it at $80,000 a person and assuming roughly 30 million descendants of, of ex-slaves. And you can read all about how they arrive at these numbers um, online. Now, obviously there's all kinds of tricky things embedded in this scenario. You know, how would, would people have to prove their, their family tree that, they're related to former slaves. Would there, um, how far back would you go? Uh, what about black immigrants who came after the civil war? Would they qualify? What about blacks who are millionaires like Oprah Winfrey? Is she getting part of this reparations money? Um, would they qualify? It gets, it's very messy, but the idea behind this is to try to establish some rules and to quantify um, some sort of compensation for slavery. But I don't think that this messiness is necessarily a reason to dismiss it. And again, there are other models of, of reparations. One model that I've heard of is to focus an effort on maybe rehabbing certain geographical areas that still seem to be suffering from the long-term effects of redlining, for example. Um, but reparations isn't just a secular or political idea. It's also a growing belief among uh, evangelical Christians that white Christians need to tangibly demonstrate their repentance of the sins of their ancestors by paying back money that they consider that was stolen from the descendants of black slaves. So let me show you some evidence from prominent voices in evangelicalism who are advancing this view. Now, I'm going to show you a post here in just a minute um, that was made a few years ago on Facebook by the Jude 3 Project. Now, before I show you the post, and just in case you aren't familiar with the Jude 3 Project, they are a ministry that tries to bring apologetics into black churches. And I actually think that this endeavor is a hugely important project because the black church does have its own unique set of obstacles uh, to the Christian faith and um, questions about is Christianity a white man's religion is a, is a big one. Um, they need solid scholarship to pre present evidences for the faith to black young people. And Jude three project has, has done some really good work in the past doing that. 
Um, but the Jude 3 Project also platforms Christian thought leaders who advocate for reparations. So here is a post from their uh, Facebook page from 2016, and it talks about, it's a quote, um, not only reconciliation or racial reconciliation, but also reparations, restoration, and repayment are central to the gospel. And as a responsibility, we've inherited to, by choosing to follow Christ. And so you notice that in this quote, there, there is sort of this call and connection for, to, to link uh, reparations and the gospel. Now, along these lines, we're going to hear another voice in this space, which is Akemeni Uwan. This is uh, a an article um, from a small town newspaper where she was quoted. Now, Uwan is a graduate of Westminster Theological Seminary, the Reformed Seminary, a fairly well. When I was in seminary, uh, Westminster was was a fairly conservative seminary. So this is this is a post, uh, a news article. Uh, from the Frederick Post News, which I must think is like a um, a local newspaper, but it's a story about reparations, and we're going to scroll down here a bit. This is a story about Princeton Seminary um, actually providing free tuition to uh, black students as as sort of a form of reparations. So I'm going to scroll down here a bit, and I'm going to keep going, and. Let's see, where is that? Keep going, keep going, and, oh, yeah, keep going. And, oh, should have had this queued up a little bit here. Um, Yeah, keep going. All right, here we go. Oh, go right there. Gospel call for reparations. Um, The entire gospel message of the Bible is a reparation, said Akemeni Uwan, a public theologian and co-host of the Truth Table podcast. The Christian church should be leading the reparations movement. The original sin in the Bible of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden led to a break in between humanity and God. And the sins of humans that would follow detailed in the Bible all came from the original sin, but were repaired in the arrival of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So this is how she's hooking together the gospel and reparations, is this this idea of God repairing our sin. And so Jesus died on the cross to repair the break between God and humanity. Uwan said, that is the reparation. And so then she, from there, uses that as kind of a biblical foundation for the idea of repentance. And she says quite readily, if I scroll down here a bit, that reparations would require a sacrifice Uwan said, likely in the form of money. So that's that's what she's talking about. The reluctance of white Christians to discuss or advocate for reparations may come down to a selfishness and a narrow view of the gospel. It is to focus on an individual salvation that can cause blindness to social realities. Now, this is what we see a lot in the Christian reparations idea, is a hooking together first of reparations in the gospel And then talking about, well, your view of the gospel is too narrow. It mostly focuses on individualism. Uh, Let's continue to try to make our case more recently. uh, This is a tweet from just a few weeks ago from Pastor Charlie Dates, who's a uh, pastor in Chicago of a fairly sizable church. He says, I'm not sure there can be reconciliation without reparations. Anybody serious about racial reconciliation has to likewise be serious about correcting the 250 plus year economic disadvantage inflicted on black Americans. Now, somebody in response to this tweet asked dates what reparations would look like. And so I thought his response was was, again, interesting. If you remember, Juan was talking about money Uh, here in dates tweet. He says, we're going to go down a little bit. Keep going. Uh, I thought I sent you a direct link to that one, but maybe oh, wait, I didn't. Wait, wait, maybe. Oh, there it is. There it is. College with no cost, student loan forgiveness, homestead provisions, land to live on. So that's similar to the Sherman's field order. Forgivable home loans, seed money to start a business. That's sort of the mule idea. Tax incentives and breaks. And number five is sort of open-ended. We could go on and on. So 
Uh, you can go back and, and look at all the responses there to Dates' tweet, but his tweet led to actually an entire blog post by Brian Loritz, who's the author of several popular books by Christian publishers. And um, this is just a few of his books. Uh, this one, The Dad Difference, just came out, but a very popular one that we've had a number of people ask us about at the Center for Biblical Unity is Right Color, Wrong Culture. Um, and I think there's one more, maybe, yeah, Insider Outsiders, another very famous book. And he has a book with some comments on Martin Luther King Jr.'s letters, letters to a Birmingham jail. So Lawrence is a pretty big name. He's also a member of the Board of Trustees uh, at Biola University and does a lot of speaking for them in chapel. And he um, is a pastor. And so he's a he's a pretty big name. And he he responded with an entire blog post that I want to look at in some detail throughout this teaching. So this is just a, a screen cap of the blog post here. It's called At the Table, Reparations and the Spirit of the Gospel. Now, um, thankfully, I downloaded screenshots of this post before uh, it was actually removed a few days later. But I think it's an important post because it reflects what I'm seeing promoted with increasing frequency among evangelicals. So I want to look at the opening uh, paragraph here, uh, the next slide. There it is. Um, he talks about Charlie Dates' tweet. He says, recently, my friend and little brother in ministry, uh, Pastor Charlie Dates, tweeted about the need for reparations and reconciliation. And what he saw was that the, the comments, and you can go look on Twitter for yourself to, to vet this, that there was sort of this black and white divide among Christians in terms of how they responded to the tweet. Um, but I thought his his description here was interesting. This divide, and I'm pretty sure he's referring to white people, is a reminder of how poorly the body of Christ has been discipled into our new communal humanity. Um, and he's really saying, what he's saying here is that an awful lot of white Christians don't understand the gospel. And so he's going to kind of break that down for us in some detail. So let's go on to the next slide. He says, now, I, I appreciate this qualification that Loritz gives here. He says, please don't misunderstand me as saying that reparations are essential for me or all other minorities as being a must for ethnic unity. I appreciate that. He's, he's saying that there's some room there, like we're not going to make unity between Christians um, an absolute uh, contingency, contingent on reparations. Um, but he does want to seek to explore how the God, spirit of the gospel may move any barriers to collective relational reconciliation between blacks and whites. So he, he is clearly trying to hook reparations and the gospel together. And the, his purpose is to challenge white people to consider his case. I have one more little uh, slide here that we've got. Um, there, and this is where we get to our Zacchaeus um, conversation that we're going to have tonight. There is no clearer example of this than Zacchaeus's spirit-induced commitment to reparations in Luke 19. Um, Zacchaeus, and he calls him Zach, <laughs> is the chief tax collector. This position entailed systemic injustice. So he's tying in a, a contemporary word. It's not a biblical word of systemic injustice, but he's, he's tying it into an idea to go the extra mile and offer reparations. And Jesus responds by affirming his salvation. So the story of Zacchaeus is put forward very frequently as the key biblical passage in support of reparations. All right, I'm going to take a minute here to check the comments and see how we're doing before we start talking about uh, Zacchaeus in earnest. Oh, Jawad, hello. I haven't seen you in a while. Um, Jawad says, I do not think that offering reparations for the colored people is the answer. Uh, granting them equal opportunities in our Western society and getting racial barriers off their way is. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, looks like Monique is really on the, on the questions tonight. Um, all right, Brian, welcome to you. All right, I think we're good. All right, I'm going to go on then. 
Oh, go back to that comment. Somebody just popped something on there. Melissa. So from the Ten Commandments, do not steal, do not covet, no longer apply. If you can find a historical reason why you should have what someone else has and make them give it to you via guilt. Well, that's a very good question. And some people bring that up, Melissa. So we will get into uh, some of that a little bit later because that is a very important question to consider. Okay, in the second part of this teaching, I'm now going to move into the Zacchaeus story and I'm gonna look at the right camera. Um, So we're gonna start talking about Luke chapter 19. So if you have your Bibles, you might wanna turn there. I'm gonna go verse by verse. And my really my hope, quite honestly, in these teachings is sometimes they take a little long. I'm not like a big one verse kind of gal. I really want to teach people how to properly handle the word. And we can't do that if we're only looking at one verse. We've got to look at the whole context. So, you know, if you're looking for a really quick answer, this is not the stream for you. Uh, but if you're really wanting to learn how to, how to interpret scripture, I'm going to walk us through some things here together tonight. So we're going to start... In Luke chapter 19, so if you want to grab your Bible, you can turn there. And I'm going to look at Bible Gateway um, in the NIV translation. Now, verse 1 says that Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through on his way to Jerusalem is where he was going. So this is a very important um, thing to notice because we want to get some um, geographical context Here's a little Bible tip. If you're reading scripture, always have a Bible nearby or a map. That's what I mean to say is always have a map nearby. Take the time to look it up. So here's a little map of Israel at the time of Jesus. And hopefully we have it. There we go. So we can see here, Jerusalem is sort of underlined there at near the bottom uh, in the middle, you can see, and you can see if you look directly up and to the right, you can see Jericho. It's not that far away. There we go. Thanks, Bob. So there's Jericho. And then right underneath there is Jerusalem. So Jesus is on his way, um, to Jerusalem, but he goes through Jericho. Now, Jesus had just encountered a poor blind man who was begging on the road as he was walking into the city of Jericho at the end of Luke chapter 15, or I'm sorry, at the end of Luke chapter 18. So as he's walking into the city, Jesus heals this blind beggar and that man uh, becomes a disciple of Jesus. And this is going to be an important point because I think that Luke has these two stories next to each other for a reason. But our tendency is to start reading in Luke chapter 19. But we always have to remember these chapter numbers are completely man-made. They're totally arbitrary. So I think that Luke wants the reader to contrast the poor beggar who was out on the road at the end of Luke 18 with Zacchaeus, this very wealthy man at the beginning of Luke chapter 19. Okay, so let's continue with uh, verse 2. Um A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was the chief tax collector and was wealthy. Okay, now Luke introduces us to our main character right here. And he wants us to know something very important about Zacchaeus. He wants us to know that he's the chief tax collector. Now he's telling us with this little detail, he's kind of the chief sinner in the the town. He's, He's telling us, that he's a chief tax collector and that he's wealthy. Now, Zacchaeus is not your average person. He isn't some poor waif off the street like the blind man, someone to have compassion on. He's not a compassion, compassionate character in the story. He's the one who supervised the other tax collectors in his area. Uh, he's the chief tax collector He might be the crook in chief, okay? Uh, He was probably very shrewd. Uh, He probably had good management skills because he was supervising other people. He had to likely interact with the Romans quite a bit. So he had to have some level of political savvy. And he was also looked upon by the fellow Jews as being kind of a traitor and being unclean because he was interacting with Gentiles so much. 
but he was a person of stature. He he would have probably easily been known in the town, possibly recognizable. It was possible that everyone in the town knew who he was because he was the chief tax collector. It's possible that if Jesus had come through Jericho before, he might have even known who Zacchaeus was. But what Luke wants us to know by telling us that he was the chief tax collector is that he was seen by his peers in the town. that he was, he was a thief. He was a corrupt man. And that his wealth was likely rooted in what we call dirty money. Okay. Okay. Let's go on to the next verse. Let's look at verse chapter, uh, verse three. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. Now, just for fun, I looked up uh, what a picture of this sycamore fig tree might have looked like. Uh, This is actually a picture of one uh, in Jericho. And it's kind of a a fun little thing. Uh, He would have climbed a tree sort of like this uh, to look to to see uh, to see Jesus over the crowd. Now, about this business of Zacchaeus being short, (laughs) it's kind of interesting. I I actually looked this up in the Greek and it seems like another possible translation might be that he was young. Um, We see here in the verse and I have a little Greek transliteration here of the passage. Um, it says, <laughs> that's not the right verse, but that's okay. We won't worry about that. Uh, um, no, it's, um, verse, uh, three should be verse three. There we go. All right. <laughs> okay. Uh, he was short. And if you look at this word, Bob, if you could click on that word Micros, just hover over Micros right there. Yeah. Just click on it. And it should take you to a, tr- a definition. Little or small, but it can also mean young and age. You can see there. Um, so it could be that he was short or it could be that he was a young man. Uh, both translation would, would be warranted. But he did climb the tree, so maybe we we kind of lean toward the translation that he was of short stature. Not a big deal, but it is sort of an interesting detail that Luke wants us to know for some reason. Now, there's another important detail that Luke wants us to know, and that is that Zacchaeus wants to investigate Jesus. He's he's actively pursuing Jesus. He wants to meet Jesus, or at least hear Jesus. And this makes me think that. Zacchaeus is looking for a change in his life. You don't start climbing a tree to look at an itinerant rabbi who's coming into town uh, for no reason. I think he's, he's taking some initiative here to try to find out more about Jesus. And I think it's also interesting that Zacchaeus's name means pure in Hebrew. And I think what Luke is trying to do in the story of Zacchaeus in part is to contrast the story of the rich young ruler, which is also in Luke chapter 18. If we were to um, go to the previous chapter, right before Jesus heals the blind beggar on the road into Jericho, there's this interchange between the rich young ruler um, in Luke chapter 18 and Jesus. And I think that, again, we're supposed to kind of contrast Zacchaeus with the blind man And we're also supposed to contrast Zacchaeus with the rich young ruler. Both Zacchaeus and the rich young ruler were wealthy men, but one was self-righteous and would not give up his possessions, while the other ends up giving half his possessions to the poor. But I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Let's go back to verse uh, 5 here in Luke chapter 19. It says, When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said, to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. Now, hospitality is a huge cultural value in the Middle Eastern culture, even today. So I, I do wonder what the protocol was for an itinerant rabbi 
to invite himself over to a rich man's house. Maybe that was an honor. Um, maybe it was weird. I don't know. I really couldn't find anything on that, but I was curious. So if you have any insight about that from a cultural perspective, write it in the chat because I would I would love to know. Um, but either way, we can tell that Zacchaeus was excited about the prospect of having Jesus come. All right, let's go back to uh, verse seven here. It says, all the people saw this and began to mutter. He has gone to be the guest of a sinner. Now, again, Luke is, is emphasizing Zacchaeus was a sinner. <laughs> um, but I want you to notice who's upset here in, in the text. It's not the Jewish leaders. Normally, they're kind of the, the villains of the story, if you will. But this time, it's not the Jewish leaders. It's the people. It's, it's, it's the normal, regular, everyday people. In other words, the, it's what I call concern trolls, you know, and, and, and they're the ones that are concerned for Jesus, that he's polluting himself by hanging out with the chief sinner of the town. It's the regular people. They're, dis, they're disturbed about, about what Jesus is doing here. Now, the word sinner here is, is, is referring to the reality that Zacchaeus doesn't keep the moral, the Mosaic law. He, he's looked upon as, as someone who is far from God. He is seen as being ritually unclean, most likely because of his dealings with the Romans. He's also seen as a thief. So he breaks God's law. He, he is not a holy person. <laughs> his life does not depict God's standards of justice. So why is Jesus hanging out with this guy? He's a corrupt government official who's likely ripped off all of his neighbors. Okay, let's go. Let's continue with the story in in, uh, verse eight. It says, but Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look, Lord, here and now I give half my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Now, this is interesting. Because the NIV translation is a little, a little vague here. So we're going to um, go back to the Greek here for a minute and look at verse 8 in, in the Greek. And we're going to notice something ab- about what is said. Um, it says Zacchaeus as he stood there. The, the idea here is that it's almost like he's, he's stopping in his tracks. You know, his, his, his neighbors have just kind of called him out. <laughs> And said, you know, he's unclean. Why is Jesus hanging out with him? And then he, he, he's, he's just standing there, you know, kind of all of us, uh, you know, he's just kind of trying to figure out what response he's going to give. And it, it says, look, half of what I own, Lord, I will give to the poor. Um, and, and the idea here is that he's, he's kind of, He's, he's already doing it. The, 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 the verb tense here is, is not a future tense, even though it, it looks like it. It's, it's actually a present tense. It's like he's telling Jesus, I'm not like that. I, I'm not a cheater. Uh, maybe he overheard what the people were saying about him, and he wants Jesus to know, I, I'm not like that. He's letting us know that, that he's, he's already going against the stereotype about tax collectors. He's wanting Jesus to know that he understands. Um, he, he wants Jesus to know he isn't merely interested in the hospitality and having Jesus over. He wants Jesus to know like, hey, I really want to lead a holy life. I want to live in such a way that I abide by God's justice standards. And, and what I read in the Mosaic law. Um, and, and when we think about like, well, why was he, why did he choose, you know, giving away half of his possessions to the poor? Why is he doing that? We don't really know. Um, it's possible. One possible explanation is that in Exodus chapter 30, it, it talks about um, every time there was a census People were supposed to pay um, half a shekel to the kind of the temple tax. You could see here at the end of verse 13, this half a shekel is an offering to the Lord. And it, it was a way of paying a temple tax. 
And it says that one must pay the Lord a ransom for his life at the time he is counted. So when you're counted in the census, you kind of pay this, this tax almost as a, as a thank you uh, to God uh, for your life. And, and you pay this half a shekel. Now, some people have, have speculated, well, maybe he, he chose 50%. He takes this 50% ransom for his life to the extreme. Maybe he's so incredibly grateful for Jesus's forgiveness. He wants to give away half of everything he owns to the poor. Like, wow, that's, that's some amazing, amazing levels of gratitude of seeing the grace of God toward him. Um, but then there's a second thing. It's not just enough that he's giving away half of his money. He's, he's wanting to repay those that he's cheated times four. And in Exodus chapter 22, um, it says this, if anyone gives a neighbor silver or goods for safekeeping and they're stolen from the neighbor's house, the thief, if caught, must pay back double. So it's it, this law about thieves paying back is a really big component of the reparations argument. Um, we call this restitution, where we, uh, in God's law, the people were expected to pay back the people that they had uh, stolen from times two. Well, again, Zacchaeus goes even far beyond that. He says, I'm going to pay back those I cheated times four. Um, and so instead of paying double of the amount, he pays quadruple the amount. He's so remorseful for his sin that he, he doubles what he wants to pay back his neighbor. It's, it's, it's really um, quite remarkable. Um, some have speculated that maybe this verse in 2 Samuel chapter 12 it refers to why he doubles it. Um, it says, this is the um, exchange between King David and, and the prophet Nathan about um, Bathsheba. And, and Nathan tells David this story of a man um, stealing a lamb. And he says, as surely as the Lord lives, this man who stole this lamb must die. He must pay for the lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity on his neighbor. In other words, he had no compassion. He just stole the neighbor's property. And so possibly Zacchaeus paid four times the amount because he just felt so, he recognized that he didn't regard his neighbors with pity or compassion. He was just stealing from them. And so he follows in the example of, of this passage about giving back fourfold. Who knows? We don't know. But those are just some some little glimpses into the Old Testament that may have influenced Zacchaeus's thoughts and why he chose these numbers. OK, um, but again, we, we want to understand that his his big desire, his heart's desire was to to express, I think um, he wanted to live a holy life. He wanted to obey Jesus. He wanted to show that he was someone who valued God's justice system, a God's standard of justice. All right, let's finish out the story here and read verses 9 and 10. It says, And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham, for the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. Now Jesus makes this pronouncement that salvation has come to Zacchaeus' house. And that's kind of in keeping with the Jewish understanding of households. Uh, we see this in the book of Acts when salvation comes to the household of Cornelius or the household of the Philippian jailer. There's a very common ancient idea of kind of this, this, if something comes into the house, it comes to everyone in the house. And as the father goes, so does the home. And as the home goes, so does the the local institutions or, or the local church. It's an important lesson for us to understand today that um, I think as patriarchy is under attack in our culture, the importance of, of the men in, in the ancient context that as the men went, so went the household. And um, that became the building blocks of the church. That's a little aside. Um, so Jesus describes Zacchaeus as a son of Abraham. And this is supposed to make us as the readers um, think about the question, well, 
who are the real and authentic children of Abraham? And Jesus came to, to restore the inheritance of the kingdom of God that was, had been lost due to Israel's unfaithfulness under the old covenant. And now he's clarifying who the rightful inheritors are of that kingdom. So when, he, when Jesus proclaims that Zacchaeus is a son of Abraham, what he is saying is this man is a true heir of the kingdom. So, so even though his neighbors thought he was all, he was, he was corrupt. He was the sinner in chief in the town. Jesus is now making a different proclamation over him. He's saying, no, this is a true son of Abraham. So the Jews thought they were the real children of Abraham. But, but Jesus is coming and saying, no, this person you think is outside the covenant is actually in the covenant. He's actually a true son of Abraham. Why? Because he's obedient to the father's words. He's believing in me as the Messiah, and he's, he's, he's obeying the laws. He, he's obeying um, what righteousness looks like. Zacchaeus demonstrates his identity as a true son by obeying God's standard of justice. He's not earning his salvation, but he's demonstrating his gratitude for it and the reality of the transformation that, that comes to his heart. So here we have, let's go back to our context. This is so important. We have the Zacchaeus story. But right before that, we had the story of the poor blind beggar being healed as Jesus is walking into Jericho. So now we have both the poor man and the rich man, both saved back to back. Very different stories of salvation but both saved, both coming into the kingdom, both becoming true sons of Abraham. Both make the decision to join the movement that seeks to destroy the gulf that divided them socially. If they were look at each other in a worldly way, these two men have nothing in common. The blind beggar and the, the chief tax collector. They have nothing socially in common. Everything socially divides them, Okay. But how is it that they both become children of Abraham? How is it that they both come into the kingdom? By Jesus dealing with their sin. Sin is the one problem that all humans have in common. And Jesus is the one solution to that problem. Okay, I'm going to check the comments real quick here. I'll go over to YouTube. Hopefully you guys are finding this helpful. All right. All right. Thank you, Monique, for jumping in there. Okay. I think we're, we're good. Yes, Eula says that the Nestle Elan uh, New Greek New Testament says that in Greek that Zacchaeus was young in age. Yeah, that's, that's what I had heard too. But then there's the whole tree thing. So I don't know. I think it could kind of, uh, both translations could be warranted. I just thought it was an interesting... Okay. Uh, could be young and short. Yeah. If he was young, that makes me think that he may have inherited the post as a family thing. Um, it's just, that's a speculation, but it makes me wonder that. Okay. So now we're going to go into kind of the third movement of the teaching here. Uh, now that we have sort of a solid understanding of Zacchaeus under our belt, we've, we've looked at the context, we've, we've, gone in and looked at the details. We've pulled back out and looked at the larger context. We compared and contrasted Zacchaeus with the blind beggar and with the rich young ruler. So now let's return to our big question of, does the story of Zacchaeus provide a biblical warrant for reparations? Okay. So we're going to go back to the blog post by Brian Loritz, and we're going to look at a few more highlights here. Hopefully. So he's, he has this analogy. He says, let's imagine a black person and a white person sit down across from each other at the table of the gospel. And the discussion is reparations. Both acknowledge a huge historic wrong and both agree that the centuries old wrong continues to reverberate to this day. So if we were to think about that for a minute, um, 
It might be a look at things like redlining, that even though the practice of redlining has, has stopped on paper, it has a, a, an effect that still reverberates today. What would the gospel go- com- demand? Okay, now I want us to pay attention here. The guiding principles of the gospel is love for God and neighbor, along with a commitment to lay down rights among others. Okay, <laughs> I, want, I, I underlined this part. It's very important. The guiding principles of the gospel is love for God and neighbor. Now, if we were in a classroom, I would ask for a little audience participation. Um, what is wrong with that statement? What is, what is incorrect about that statement? Let's put it back up on the screen so people can really see it. The guiding principles of the gospel is love for God and neighbor. If we were in a classroom, I'd say, okay, who knows? <laughs> Does anyone have any insights or any thoughts about this? Okay. Loving God and loving your neighbor is law, not gospel. That is how we summarize God's law. That is the summary of the law. It is not the gospel. The gospel is is what Jesus does for us on the cross so that we may have... a relationship, a covenant relationship with the Father. There's a fundamental but very common misidentification of the gospel that's happening here. It's actually conflating law and gospel. And this is a major problem in that I see in the conversation about reparations from, from many very well-meaning Christians. It's very common to conflate these two things. I'm going to go to the next slide because it kind of helps to, to clarify this a bit more. Um, he says, now I fully understand the pushback of this story. Zacchaeus was the one who did wrong. While white people today have not owned slaves. And I'm sure we can have robust exchanges over the present day aftershocks of slavery, which continues to advantage one group and disadvantage another. Yet the insistence to dig in and not even consider the possibility of reparations is to elevate lesser arguments over the spirit of the gospel. Okay, here again, he's conflating law and gospel. Um, And he somewhat concedes that Zacchaeus is the one who who did wrong. Um, he, He can't actually get us to reparations through the story of Zacchaeus. But then he kind of switches the argument a little bit subtly, okay? He conflates law and gospel, and then let me go back to the the slide there at the ending. In the end, he says at the last line, reparations are a cheap price to pay for true Christian unity. So now he's saying if you don't pay reparations— there can't be unity. This strikes me as like, well, I know that people are going to say Zacchaeus is just a story about individuals, which we're going to talk about in a minute. But if you don't get on board with the, with supporting reparations, then we can't have unity. This kind of <laughs> strikes me as as troubling. It 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 is a bit of a shift in the conversation. I think that makes the case shift from, well, let me give you my reasons why Zacchaeus is the biblical warrant for for reparations to an appeal to guilt or an appeal to pity is what we call in in logic. And that's, that's an informal fallacy. But he also wants to shift the conversation about reparations to being a gospel issue. And I see this happen all the time in a lot of Christian social justice conversations is they they want to attach nearly everything to be a gospel issue. And who wants to deny the gospel? I, I don't want to be a gospel denier, but it's it's this kind of shell game that they that they play. And so there's a lot of things happening in this post. There's a conflation of law and gospel. There's a sh- there's a recogni- recognition. Well, Zacchaeus is really just telling us a story about an individual sin, but then there's the shift to 
well, we can't really have unity until we get to reparations. It's it 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 it's an interesting way to to unfold this argument. But he arrives at this conclusion that reparations is a cheap price to pay for unity. Okay, let's keep going here. Um, let's go to the next one. There we go. He says, on the other side of the table sit my African-American siblings. I genuinely feel we are owed more than an apology. Uh, something more than statements and apologies needs to be done. I believe in reparations. So this is where he's, he's really wanting us to go, is to arrive at reparations. So even though he said early in the article that he would not withhold Christian unity over reparations, which I greatly appreciate, and, and he was wanting to make his case for reparations. Here he seems to kind of sort of maybe take that back um, because he, he says he's genuinely feels blacks are owed more than an apology and that he believes in reparations. So um, let me, let me go to uh, go to the next slide here. Yeah. However, and I think this is, this is a very important point and I appreciate this point. The gospel will not allow me to wait on reparations in order to dispense forgiveness and love. A failure to love ones who have wronged you is the decision to remain in bondage. This is the uncomfortable, equitable truth of the gospel. The same gospel which would compel our white siblings to go above and beyond also says to the descendants of African involuntary diaspora to go the extra mile. So he's kind of saying, yes, Blacks should fight for justice and whites need to get on board with, with reparations. So it kind of sounds to me like this type of a scenario that he's thinking of like a situation where you might have a friend who borrows money from you uh, for $300 or something and, and they never pay you back. Um, but you're trying to be the bigger person and, and you're trying to forgive them and, and move on. Um, but you know, in your heart, that person still, still owes you money. Um, and so what Loretz is saying is that he really wants to extend forgiveness. He will extend forgiveness, but he won't really take the other Christians seriously, the white Christian seriously, who isn't ready to repent and demonstrate their repentance through reparations. And that's how that kind of functionally sounds to me. Um, and when I hear Christians of this orientation get to this point in the conversation, they'll often appeal to Matthew 5.23 as a warrant for their position. They'll, they'll say things like, um, well, if, if you know that your brother has an offense with you, you need to go resolve that. You need to go be reconciled to them. Otherwise, God will not accept your worship. Um, so you will not, uh, if you don't settle matters quickly with your adversary, um, then you will basically get destroyed. <laughs> and so the Christian reparations advocates will point to this warning in Matthew 5 as implying that worship without reconciliation is unacceptable to God. So if white Christians fail to reconcile completely with our black brothers and sisters via real tangible, costly repentance, acts of repentance, such as reparations, then God may be actually discounting our worship. He may be turning away from us. He may actually be, be judging us. Okay, we're going to go to the last slide here, I believe, on the article. So back to the table. White brothers and sisters, may your love for we as African Americans outpace your defensiveness as you have you may have against reparations. It's a small price to pay for reconciliation, is it not? So Christian reparations advocates will say that the only way you can come to the table is if you are ready to pay those reparations. And again, Loretz calls it a very small price to pay. So there's, there's the way I see it is, is kind of like, okay, we concede that, yeah, technically at the cross, we have unity, but then they're functionally setting up this kind of man-made barrier of redividing the body, um, something that is already united in, in the Holy Spirit through the death of Christ, um, because they're waiting for white Christians to get on board 
with reparations and then and then true unity and and racial reconciliation in the body of Christ can happen. But until then, it will be hindered, if not withheld by some. Now, Loritz isn't advocating withholding unity, but he is trying to appeal to white Christians to, um, if you look, if you really want unity, then here's what you need to do. Now, if we were talking about the generation after the Civil War, I could more easily see that the case for reparations and using this this passage from Zacchaeus. I mean, um, there is a portion of the population of our country who, who did build wealth on the backs of slaves. And, and I think it's important to notice what God's standard of justice is when it comes to the release of slaves. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 15, uh, starting in verse 12, says, If any of you pe- your people, Hebrew men or women, sell themselves to you and serve you for six years, In the seventh year, you must let them go free. And when you release them, do not send them away empty handed. Supply them liberally with your flock, your threshing floor and your wine press. Give them as to the Lord as as the Lord has blessed you. Remember when you were slaves in Egypt, the Lord God redeemed you. That is why I give you this command today. This is very important. So it's very similar. It harkens us back to General Sherman's 40 acres and our mule. Slavery has an end according to scripture um, in, and uh, although American slavery certainly violated many of God's laws and I'm not, it's not the purpose of this communication tonight. We still see the God's heart of, for the former slave um, s- freedom for slaves came after a maximum of, of six years there, you couldn't have lifetime slavery. You couldn't be man snatched or kidnapped and forced into slavery well, those those scenarios would um, violate God's law. Uh, slavery had a maximum shelf life of six years, and the the owner was was required. If you wanted to be a holy person, if you wanted to be a righteous person, you were to generously help your former slave start a new life with an array of provisions to help them be able to sustain themselves. Being able to sustain yourself is, is a big part of, of God's, God's law. So in this sense, if President Johnson in the 1860s had followed the, the biblical example of what we see in the Mosaic law, we, we actually might not be in this situation right now. Um, and I think that's important to, to recognize. But, but this brings us to the rather difficult situation of applying the Zacchaeus story to our modern context, because Zacchaeus repaid the people he had directly wronged. And Brian Loritz basically acknowledges that, um, that God's standard of justice is about paying people back that were directly wronged by my actions. And, and that's not the situation that we're in right now. I think the difficulty here is that um, a lot of people have died, <laughs> Um, there's been a lot of intermarriage. There, uh, there's been a lot of industrialization, immigration. Uh, the world is, has changed since the 1860s. And we've, we've seen a lot of generations. And this is where I think the, the use of the Zacchaeus story as, as a warrant for reparations begins to break down in terms of its usefulness um, for the reparations movement. I just don't think it can do all the heavy lifting that the Christian reparations people are, are wanting it to do. There's just n- nothing in the text here that, that we've just looked at in some detail um, that requires someone to pay another person for theft committed by previous generations. Um, in fact, there are specific scriptures that say that the children will not be held guilty for the sins of their fathers. Deuteronomy chapter 24 says, parents are not to be put to death for their children nor children put to death for their parents. Each will die for their own sin. Um, we see this kind of repeated by Jesus that in, that uh, people will become children of Abraham because they believe in Jesus. It won't be enough to have your parents just be Jewish. Uh, you have to believe that Jesus is the Messiah. So there, there are scriptures that actually say God holds people responsible Um for the sins of their fathers under the old covenant, but that's God holds them responsible 
when we as human judges punish each other, the case law is that children cannot be held guilty for the sins of their fathers or vice versa. Um, Whatever debts remain outstanding are canceled after seven years. So even if someone owes debts um, under the Mosaic law, after seven years, those debts are forgiven. Uh, It talks about that in Deuteronomy chapter 20. Um, It talks about debt cancellation or Deuteronomy chapter 15. Thank you. Um, So, you know, we our our debts don't come down to our children. Our sins don't come down to our children. So God seems to know he's so gracious. He seems to know that sometimes we just need a do over. Um, We are such sinful creatures and he graciously provides for that. And under the new covenant, I think this is why we're all, there's so much conversation in the new covenant about being generous in our forgiveness. Um, In my view, the lack of, of, biblical warrant for multi-generational guilt is a significant problem for the biblical case for the current um, Christian reparations movement. Now, if you want to think more about these things, my friends, Neil Shenvey and Pat Sawyer have written an extended article on this issue. So I'm just going to refer you to that as an additional resource. um, And I'll add it to the YouTube link description after uh, I sign off the air here, but this is a great article, a very extended discussion about this whole business of corporate repentance and historical sins. So the third point I want to make here about Zacchaeus is that we see in Zacchaeus's response, it, it, it really springs from his heart. It's rooted in his desire to repent from his sin and obey God's law. It's not the result of a massive government tax, nor is it, uh, does God's law require the money be taken from one group of people who are rich and redistributed to another group of people. Rather, God's standard of justice um, required thieves to pay restitution. Um, Restitution is not the same thing as the modern concept of multi-generational reparations. Now, often in the conversation, you'll hear people and they'll try to collapse these two ideas, but it's not really the same thing. Um, Restitution is the biblical idea of repaying the wronged party directly. And that's, again, not what reparations advocates are saying. Modern reparations advocates want one group to pay another group based largely on skin color, not exclusively, but largely on skin color for actions of a third group who wronged a fourth group. Um, That is not the biblical idea of restitution. So all of that said, um, I do want to make one additional point here. And I I think that... Um, although I don't, I'm not persuaded that a case can be made for uh, biblically for reparations. I, I don't want to imply that Christians should just simply wash their hands of the discussion about reparations. I, I, I'm not an advocate for government reparations um, because reparations implies repair and healing. Um, and I'm, I'm just not persuaded that the problem of racial division in our country would actually be solved with money. Um, Will money, will checks, will cashing checks bring an end to the disparities between blacks and whites? Um, Will will that really bring repair and healing? Will will money help us reach the post-racial utopia that we're looking for? Maybe, but I I just am being honest. I'm a bit of a skeptic about that. But I do hear the, the pain and the desire for recognition of like, hey, here's a wrong that was done. Um, and I do think that Christians ought to engage in more conversations about how they can provide partnership and support to those communities that continue to struggle, um, especially due to redlining. Um, and the lingering effects of that and, and any spaces for that matter where poor are struggling. Um, and I think that that help can come in a variety of ways. Again, I'm, I'm not a huge advocate of more government programs and more taxes. I actually think that local private solutions will be more effective and make our dollars go farther. I think it's perfectly um, important and warranted 
for Christians to engage in conversations of what they can do in their communities, what they can do through the advocacy of small business, small establishment of small businesses, um, micro loans, helping churches start alternative schools, uh, improving the quality of education in the neighborhood, sponsoring classes on job mentoring and creating um, new companies and job opportunities. Churches can provide, I think, help with transitional housing and mentoring to those people who have been incarcerated and, and providing father figures for these people and providing mentorship and discipleship, providing for group homes founded on, on principles of human dignity for the mentally ill and the handicapped. There are many, many things that local churches could be doing and should be doing to reach into those spaces that need help. But all of these things can be done on an individual level. Um, I think that 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 is important, that what makes Zacchaeus's response so amazing is that it sprang from his heart, from a conviction. It was a, well, I voted for this politician so he could, he could take these taxes and, and redistribute it to these people over here. What makes it holy in scripture is, is the idea of self-governance that, that I, in a conversation with the Holy Spirit, have a level of conviction and he leads me to do things in my, in my world, in my family, in my local church, in my community that help to recognize and alleviate suffering and bring God's uh, standard of justice to bear in the real world. Um, on an individual level, again, and now if, if someone were to find out that their wealth had been gained through theft or unjust means in a previous generation. And if that person wanted to do something tangible to repay the people who were directly harmed um, or their, or their descendants, their grandchildren, or if they wanted to sell an asset um, that maybe benefited because of redlining and they, they know that uh, the Holy spirit convicts them of that. And they want to donate that money to help a group that helps to lift the descendants of slaves out of poverty, then, then great, by all means, do that. That is a great example of following in the footsteps of Zacchaeus. It's to use your personal assets by your own free will decision to, in response to the Holy Spirit, to help others around you and to right a wrong. And, and that is something to definitely get into a conversation with the Lord about. But um, can I make the case from scripture for large scale government reparations program? Now, I just don't think Zacchaeus can, can do that heavy lifting for us. Um, if a Christian wants to sell an asset and donate it, great, sure, do that. Do whatever the Lord leads you to do. Uh, should churches consider how they can partner with other churches to build long term opportunities for real change in impoverished areas? Should Christians consider partnership um, and and how they can, uh, with the power of the Holy Spirit, give sacrificially to others. Definitely. That's a worthy goal. All of those things are good. Um, so I don't know. I'm hoping this is helping you. Let's go back out to the comments again and see if there's anything there. Okay. Yes, Juwad, you're right. There were some laws that were different for Jews and Gentiles. Not all. Some some laws um, in the Mosaic law said this is for both the, the, the citizen and the foreigner. And then there were other laws that were just for the citizen or just for the foreigner. You're right about that. Um, okay. And I want to let our friends know that Juwad is our Muslim friend. And I do believe he's from the UK, if I remember right. Um, so always glad to have you here. Juwad seems to be very um, knowledgeable about the scripture. So, um, Nikki says so much division simply because of the way the people are treating each other. We need to love in unique ways, make people feel special. Their story and their life is unique because of the creator. I agree. We can help people feel loved, which will promote unity. Yes. And start with individual people that leads to gospel conversations. Yes. Very good. All right. Churches can donate to an inner city church. Yes, they can. I, Monique and I really want to see more partnerships between churches. 
how do you have a conversation with the Holy Spirit? That's a great, com- that's a great question, Juwad. In Christianity, um, if you look in the book of James, for example, it talks about how if you need wisdom, um, y- you can ask of God and he will give it to you. The Holy Spirit, if you look in Romans chapter eight, for example, is a great long passage. Um, when we trust in Jesus as the Messiah, as the Savior, as our Savior for our sins, um, Holy Spirit actually comes to live inside of us. And so under the old covenant, the Mosaic covenant, they went to the temple to worship God. Now we are that temple and we walk around with the Holy Spirit living inside of us. And so we believe that we can actually pray and hear from God and um, that is part of what it means to be a Christian is we become the temple of the Holy Spirit. When we go to the new creation, we will have a restoration of face-to-face communication with God himself. And um, there was face-to-face communication in the Garden of Eden. That was sort of like a, a preview of coming attractions, but it will be perfected in the new creation because there will be no more sin or even the possibility of sin in the new heavens. Okay. Let's go back out to the comments. All right. Slavery has been around from the beginning and still going. It is absolutely. Slavery is still happening today. Slavery was in the book of Genesis. It is a problem because humans want to dominate and control each other. Um, so, um, and we should say, you um, you know, there have been payments that our government has made to people who were wronged. Um, and I think that that is an important and valid question to ask. Um, the Native Americans have received reparations. The Japanese have received a form of reparations. Um, and so it's not a crazy question to ask. Now, whether or not you can get there biblically to me is a different question. Whether we want to have a national conversation about repayment, I think is a fair question to ask. Um, and I think there's, we've got to have charity on both sides and we've got to make our arguments and we can't just call each other racist if we disagree. We've got to have some, have some arguments and arguments I mean in the logical sense, not in the social media sense. But um, we have to make our case. We have to put forth our evidence and our arguments and our, our ideas. And um, so... I think it's it's a fair question to ask because we have compensated other people before. Okay, let me go back here. Yes. Okay. All right. I think that's good. Uh, Bi- uh, Brian, biblically, wasn't slavery also a judgment of God? Uh, yes. Um, actually, it can be a judgment of God that um, it, one of the things that God uh, in the Mosaic covenant, one of the curses that could come over the people was that if they broke God's laws um, were, and were unrepentant about it, he could use another nation to come capture them and take them into slavery. And in fact, we see that kind of play out with the Assyrians uh, where the Assyrians conquered the Northern kingdom and carted them away. And we never really, hear from them again, uh, in scripture. So, um, okay. So hopefully this has been helpful. What have we accomplished tonight? We looked in detail at the Zacchaeus narrative. We also looked at the surrounding context. We considered the question of, of whether or not the Zacchaeus story can be used as a support for multi-generational reparations. And again, I would say the answer is no generational payback for theft is not in the context of the Zacchaeus story. I don't think it's in context in, in the context of scripture in general. Um, if we want to have a separate national conversation about reparations, I think it's a different, it's a different thing, <laughs> but I don't think we can get there biblically. I know this has been long. It's, it's my hope that by being detailed, I'm modeling for you how to properly interpret scripture, how to build a bridge to our modern context with the hope that you can, uh, can, Begin to do this kind of work yourself um, and ask yourself, you know, for yourself, uh, what does the text actually say? What is the surrounding context? So I hope this has been helpful to you and I thank you for watching. Good night and God bless. Mm-hmm.